Again, did everybody see that we have a new ATI grid? It's in Schoology. We actually have a renal package that you could be working on. Um, I did put the GI practice uh, test answer key in Schoology, so that's there for you guys to see. Again, don't memorize. Some of the questions might be similar, but don't, don't think that they're going to all be exactly the same thing. So don't memorize, just understand the concepts for GI. Um, and for instance, what you would, how you would treat your sclerosis patient. How would you treat your pancreatic patient that has pancreatitis, acute versus chronic? What are some things you would think about with your Crohn's disease patient? Uh, ulcerative colitis. Hint, it's going to be a fluid volume issue. Remember that, that's one of the questions on the test because the patient has large, large amounts of um, di bloody diarrhea. So those are the questions that are going to be on there. Again, they're all going to be things where you have to think. There's a little bit of matching for some GI terms that you need to know and recognize, but those ascites or parasympathesis or things like that. So I'm just trying to give you guys some hints for the GI test coming up. Renal tests, we're going to get through hopefully renal this week, maybe beginning of next week. I'm hoping that we get through it this week and then maybe we take an exam on that, um, you know, next Wednesday or maybe the following Monday. I don't know. We'll just have to see how things go with the web. Um, and then what's our next section in the book? I'm just looking at the book here too while I'm talking to you. Um, so we're getting through, we got through the team, we got through fluid and electrolyte, we did GI, we did renal, renal and reproductive are both going to be on this next exam. So both things are going to be on there together. And then we're going to do musculoskeletal next. That's next in the, um, in the med search book. And then skin, and then endocrine, and then immune. And then we're done with med search. So that's good. We're, we're right on track. Looking at the grid that I gave you guys, this is exactly where we were last year, same time frame of when we were doing grid number nine. So everything is moving forward, and that's why I didn't want to just cancel today or tomorrow. We need to keep going uh, whatever way we can go. So we'll be fine. After we finish um, the med surge book, the next topic we're going to cover is going to be mental health. So we'll move into the mental health book. And then we will do uh, maternity, feed, we'll do a pharmacology section in there, and then it, it will be spring. So we're moving, we're moving along. February, which is amazing. All right, so renal, renal patients, dialysis. We talked about this the other day. There's two different types of dialysis. What does dialysis do? Who needs dialysis? There's our A, E, I, O, U people. We're just going to review it again. Um, the most efficient type, or the, um, the, most, uh, the person that's really, really sick almost always gets hemodialysis. It's usually the most efficient and quickest way to remove electrolytes and remove waste products and filter to the kidney. Remember what our kidneys do, that's our, their filtering unit. So if we don't have our kidneys working, we need some kind of machine that's gonna do that for us. So hemodialysis is your patient going usually three times a week It's usually prescribed by a nephrologist because he's a kidney doctor. Um, so nephro means kidney and he's the one that's gonna prescribe what your dialysis could be. It's all, never, never, usually, well, I'm gonna say not, don't say never, but 99% of the time, it's not gonna be your family doctor that prescribes dialysis for you. You will have seen a nephrologist and they specialize in this and how dialysis should work for that patient and what the percentage of the solution should be and what the electrolyte should be. How do we remove potassium? What is the patient's potassium? That's what they look at and, and adjust the dialysis based off of what that specific patient needs because everybody does not get the same dialysis. They might be on a little bit longer, a little bit shorter time. Um, their solution might be a little more hypotonic or it might be hypertonic. If it's more hypertonic, it's going to remove more, more fluid from the patient. Um, <clears throat> again, we'll look at the labs and then determine how well is this person's kidneys work and how well are they getting rid of these electrolytes um, and how quickly is the potassium building up? How quickly is the calcium level um, building up or going down? And these are the things that they adjust the dialysis machine or the solution to do. And again, what's our what's our um, our gold standard is having an AV crystal in it. It's the easiest way to do dialysis for the long period of time. So there's your patient getting dialysis. It's purification of the blood. That's what's happening. It's a substitute for the normal function of the kidney, and that's the kidney function of filtering and removing waste products. 
and maintaining balance for the patient. So this is just a review from what we talked about last week. Two different types, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and we're going to talk today about the differences between those two types. This is what they do. It doesn't matter what type the patients are on, but this is the function of why they're on dialysis. They're rid of excess fluid. So always be thinking that this patient with dialysis is typically before dialysis um, fluid volume overload because the kidneys aren't working. So the patient many times builds up fluid uh, in the lungs, they get crackles, um, they get swelling in their feet, um, they get excess weight. So this is why we weigh them every day. They're doing a daily weight with the same scale, same time every day. Always check that, that's your best option. Um, to achieve acid base balance, there's your A for that A E I O U and eliminate waste products. And those waste products could be electrolytes, it could be medication, those waste products could be um, street drugs that the patient took, something that the body can't get rid of because the kidney is not normally working. And then again, maintaining and restoring balance by osmosis and diffusion. If you've never had um, and to your chemistry, all osmosis and diffusion is is that water moves to a to a will move from a, a, a higher to a higher concentration where sodium is, or vice versa. And it basically moves through a membrane based off of the gradient, the osmotic gradient. And all that really is fancy words saying that water uh, water is going to follow sodium, water is going to follow electrolytes by, by adding these electrolytes in, and this, this will help us understand peritoneal dialysis, it helps pull out fluid by the process of osmosis and diffusion. If you've had AMP, you've had chemistry, you understand what this is, the only reason I mention it is you just need to recognize how this works is through this process by getting rid of fluid. Every day our kidneys process about 200 quarts of blood, remove two quarts of waste products and excess water for So here's our patients that need dialysis, A, E, I, O, U, this person with acid-base problems, so they could be very acidic or very alkalotic. Again, when we go back to ABGs and we talk about ABGs, remember there's four different types of things that the patient can do when they um, have abnormal ABGs, respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis. So of course, because we're talking about the kidneys, this is going to be a metabolic issue. Uh, it's not a respiratory issue. It doesn't have anything to do with your lungs. Now, will your lungs kick in if you become acidotic because of your kidneys? Yes, they will. Um, but we, but you have to remember, how is this going to change your respiratory pattern? If a patient has uh, respiratory opposite, that means they're more acidotic. What's going to happen with their CO2? It's going to go in the opposite direction. It's going to go up. So now what's going to happen with this metabolic acidosis? It's going to be equal. Metabolic equal. We talked about that with ADGs. So what's our metabolic lab value that we're looking for when we're looking at ADGs? It's the bicarb level, the HCO3. That's sodium bicarb. Or it's, it's just bicarb, sodium bicarb is in there. So we're looking for the bicarb level. That's what has to do with our kidneys, not the CO2. The CO2 has to do with our lungs. So we're looking for that bicarb level. Normal bicarb is 21 to 28. So if it's metabolic equal and the patient has metabolic acidosis, so, and I know we're not in class, so it's hard for me to tell, but I hope you're with me. pH is down. They're acidotic and our bicarb is down when it's a metabolic issue. So if you get an ABG question on NCLEX, what you're looking for, is it a respiratory issue or is it a metabolic issue? If it's respiratory, respiratory opposite, that means the pH went down, the CO2 went above 45, because normal CO2 is 35 to 45. If it's a metabolic issue, Metabolic equal. That means that the pH went down and so did the bicarb. So the bicarb is below 21. So hopefully just looking at those numbers will help you pick in your answer. Is it respiratory acidosis, acidosis, metabolic, blah, blah, blah. There's four choices. So you're going to have to first look at the pH and then look at the other labs. The CO2, is it up or down? Bicarb, is it up or down? 
when we get a meta, when we get an ADD question, which some of you guys might, and you will, don't get don't get all worked uh, up and nervous and anxious if it's two or three or four sentences long and it's a story and you think, oh my God, how am I ever going to know this? Look at the numbers. That's all. Look at the numbers. Look at the pH. Then go to the CO2. Then go to the bicarb and figure out is it respiratory opposite or metabolic equal. So here's your patient that needs dialysis, and it could be that their pH is 7.1. That's too low. That's acidotic. Where are we going to expect the bicarb to be? It's going to be down. It's going to be below 21. That makes it a metabolic issue. Remember, two systems in our body kick in to help us regulate our acid base. That's our lungs and our kidneys. Our lungs kick in quickly within minutes, tell us to breathe faster or breathe, breathe less. If our CO2 is going up, what do we think our lungs are going to do? They're going to make our body breathe faster to get rid of CO2. If our CO2 is down and low, what's our body going to do? It will tell us to slow down our breathing so that we can hold on to CO2 in our lungs. So this automatically happens to our brain. We're not thinking about it. We're not having to say breathe faster, breathe lower. Our body automatically does it. With our kidneys, what happens if the patient becomes metabolic acidosis, their pH is down, but their bicarb is also down, what's going to happen? The kidneys are going to, what the kidneys are going to do is hold on to the bicarb, basically not excrete as much. So your kidneys then kick in and they say, hey, your, your bicarb level is down, that's your metabolic component or number. We don't want to excrete anymore. We don't want the number to be down anymore. If your metabolic alkalosis, what's happening? Your pH is up, your bicarb is up. What do you think our kidneys are going to want to do? They're going to want to overwork and help us get rid of the extra bicarb. So that's how it works. That's how your kidneys basically maintain your pH status, your acid base status. In simple in a nutshell. We could spend days and days and days talking about ADGs and acid base problems, but we don't have days to talk about it. So I'm just trying to make it as simple as possible. So you, you get an ADG question, look at the numbers first. Don't don't get too concerned with the story. Look for look to see if it's a respiratory problem in the story or a kidney problem in the story, and that will hopefully guide you to your answer. The other person that needs dialysis electrolyte problems. What does that mean? That's your patient that has all the labs that are out of whack, the potassium is too high. That's what typically happens with dialysis patients is the electrolytes are not filtered out and all their numbers go up. So this person with that needs dialysis, their potassium would be 5.8. That's too high. 3.5 to 5 is normal. So 5.8 would be too high for that person. So again, they might need dialysis in order for us to send that fluid into their to their kidneys and make it more hypertonic and help it pull out all that excess fluid and excess electrolytes and then it's got rid of through the dialysis machine that's what it does for the kidney your person that's intoxicated there's all your drugs the protein your heroin the street drug drug percocet patient ate a bottle of percocet well then how do we help get rid of it it's going to get metabolized through the liver process through the kidney and and that's what our kidneys will do is help us get rid of those waste products well what happens when somebody overdoses or takes too much medication their kidneys can't keep up with it so we put them on dialysis to help them get rid of those excess medication. there's the person that's in the o category overload of fluid so there's your patient that does not have the ability to maintain their fluid status they have fluid volume overload that's what they have so now this person has to go on a dialysis machine, and that might be your patient with severe congestive heart failure, that no matter what we're doing, we're giving them light shifts, we're giving them diuretics, we're giving them beta blockers to help their heart pump a little stronger. Um, we are listening to their lungs, we're giving them oxygen, but for whatever reason, they can't get rid of all that excess fluid and their heart is in heart failure, not working, the pump's not working. So we might have to put them on dialysis to help get rid of the excess volume so the heart doesn't have to work so hard. And then there's your patient. Last one is uremic syndrome symptoms. That's your patient that that BUN, that, that blood, urea, nitrogen, that's BUN. Uremic symptoms means the patient has a, lot, a high BUN, high creatinine. All the urea is not being processed and got rid of in, in their urine because they're not making urine. 
so urea is building up in your system. One of the symptoms that that patient gets, they can get confusion. They get a lot of itching of their skin because the urea makes the skin dry and makes them itchy. Um, so uh, again, they what would we get their labs? We get their labs, and their DUM might be 30, 10 to 20 is normal. Their DUM might be 70. I've had patients in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Really high numbers. And we'll talk about the urinic symptoms are a little bit more in a minute. So here's all your patients that are going to need dialysis. And, and it could be for any one of these reasons. It could be a combination of the reasons. But it's an easy, easy way to remember why are we doing dialysis for somebody. Here's our 86 bill. We talked about that the other day. Usually takes about anywhere from six weeks to four months for this to mature. That's the word that we use. Once it has matured, it can provide good blood flow. Most of the time with the tissue, it's either grass or some kind of plastic little device that's put in there. And, and again, it's, it's something that uh, is made and processed and compatible with most patients and compatible with their body. Um, and so this fistula is now rerouted so that the arterial and the venous circulation in that area in that body, in your body, when we hook up to the fistula, we have a way of, of accessing an artery and accessing a vein at the same time. And again, this could be surgically put in, last longer, lower risk of infections with the fistula because they don't have a central line in your body that we've inserted. That central line can maybe stay in for six weeks. I've seen central lines in patients for maybe two months, but not a long time. Your body doesn't like that central line in. It's going to react and develop more infections than what the fistula. The fistula is surgically done under the skin. Um, so remember, here's here's our key points about somebody having a fistula. We're going to feel for a thrill. We're going to listen for a brewery. And we're going to do that every four hours or at least once a shift in real life. Our utopia is that we're going to frequently assess this AV fistula. Why? Because we want to make sure that that graft is not clogged up and is not cutting off circulation in that patient's arm, or they could lose that arm or extremity if that's if that graft clogged and we do not recognize it quick enough. So somebody with a fistula, you're going to check circulation in their hand or in their arm, in particular where that fistula is. No blood pressures, no needle sticks. Stay away from uh, hopefully the dominant hand if you can. Nothing really should be done. What else should we keep it? Not to lift with that hand if at all possible. You're trying to keep that fistula fun functioning and working as long as possible. Now, in the meantime, while you don't have the fistula, that's when we put the central line in the system. There's different names for central lines. It could be called a fucking catheter, it could be called a Sheldon. Um, typically, it's put in the chest. Um, we don't use femoral uh, for obvious reasons. It's a dirtier area. So usually it's, it's, it's the subclavian vein in the chest where this central line is put in. And again, it's a different type of port for dialysis, a different type of access. If you guys take care of somebody who wants to become a nurse and they have a dialysis access in their chest and it, you know it's for dialysis, write this down. Do not use it. Don't use it to draw blood, don't use it to administer IVs, it's for dialysis only. We don't use it, we don't mess it up. We have to use it some kind of different access, so we have to stick the patient. So they might have a purple IV in, but then they have a dialysis access in their chest. So write this down, you're not going to use the dialysis access for anything, it's just for dialysis. Why is that? Well, if we hang antibiotics and we hang blood and we hang other things and we mess it up, we now no longer have a dialysis access. And that's basically their lifeline for their kidney. So if someone had, and you know someone's dialysis patient, ask them, where's their access? Okay, if the Sheldon catheter in your chest, you're going to see a little blue, little blue cap and a little red cap, usually at uh, where the dialysis access is. And I keep pointing to my chest, but that's usually where it is. And you know it's for dialysis, tell yourself, I'm not using that. I'm not gonna give an antibiotic to that. I gotta stick the patient and see if they have a different IV access. So just remember, don't use that site because it's just for dialysis only. Um, once in a while, if the patient has very, very bad veins and they've been sick for a long time and we can't get an IV in their arm, we, I have had patients and again, this has been very rare where the doctor will say, okay, we use the dialysis catheter. And we would use the venous part of the catheter maybe to administer Lasix or whatever they need. But that's in a rare situation. So just kind of rule of thumb, don't use the dialysis catheter. Don't 
don't don't interrupt the AV test in the arm. Don't take blood pressures. Don't stick them in that arm. If they have a dialysis catheter in the chest, don't use it. Leave it alone. The dialysis nurses are the ones that are trained on how to use that catheter the right way. So here's our benefits of a fistula. Lower risk of infection, lower risk of forming clots. It performs better, lasts longer, uh, sometimes even to better. And, and again, this is just a picture of an AV test and we went over this the other day. So the, the blood from the dialysis machine comes in one way and then it goes back to the machine in a different way. Um, again, the arterial part is where the blood comes from and then it obviously gets circulated throughout the body because the arteries carry it away. And then uh, it's built, used by the body and then it returns to the venous portion of the fistula, back to the dialysis machine, the filtering is done in the machine and this lasts for Anywhere from the patient to be connected, I've seen patients as short as two hours, I've seen patients as long as four to five hours. It just depends on how much the patient needs and how effective the dialysate solution is to help the patient get their waste products. So this is just another picture of an AV graph. And look, you can see there's a little tube inside this patient's arm that connects these two portions. Sometimes it's a graph um, machine, like a mesh graph. And, not a machine, a mesh graph is put in there, or this plastic tube. Here's the graph itself. It's this white tube that's underneath the skin. Again, it's all perfectly put in under the skin. We're just feeling that thrill to make sure there's good circulation through the graph or through this little piece here, listening for a brewery with our stethoscope, and we should hear a splitting sound. And that's what we normally want to hear every time we have a catheter, a regret, a still in. Here's your subclavian vein. <clears throat> Again, this is your patient's catheter that's only going to last for several weeks. So this is, there's going to be a, a blue cap and a red cap, and we know it's for dialysis, and we're not going to use it. And, and again, at the end of dialysis, we usually squirt a little bit of heparin in this to help it from clotting off, and then they can access it again two days later when the patient comes back for dialysis. So this could be um, one way that you'll see a patient getting dialysis, but remember, this is going to be a short term solution. It's not going to be a long term for this to happen. Okay, and this is just showing you a different uh, femoral vein catheter. Now, again, very rarely will you see this anymore, and this is only in the patient that maybe, let's say, they had trauma to the chest, but they need dialysis, and we can't put a catheter in here. I have seen people, patients, with femoral catheters for dialysis. But remember, it's only short-term use, really short-term use. The, the quickest way we can get that out is get a different catheter in we do. When the patient has a femoral catheter in, one key thing is you don't want them sitting up. Why do you think not? Well, if they sit all the way up, what are they going to do? Keep off that catheter that's in your groin area. It makes sense, right? Here's where the catheter is. So again, don't tell, keep the patient at mostly semi shallow, 45 degrees. It's used temporarily for acute renal failure. And again, we're going to put a little bit of heparin in it at the end of the dialysis time frame in order to keep that catheter from clotting off. But again, thermals are not going to be, you're not going to see them a lot. Um, it, it's more like a, a, if I don't have access somewhere else, I'll put this, this IV line in. Why do we have to use a bigger? Um, that's all in our body. Well, we can't just use your arm and put a little tiny 24 gauge needle in there and think we're going to run a whole lot of dialysis solution through it. It's just not going to work. So here, this is this is a bigger vein in our body. So is our subclavian and our chest. See how much bigger that is. So that's what we're using. So there's a couple different options for us. Here's the complications of dialysis. Well, infection. Where would they get infection at? At, at the AV fistula site or at the central line site where they have. Another complication could be we don't hear the brewery and we don't feel the thrill. So now what do we think has happened? Well, something is clotted off inside that graft or inside that um, that fistula site itself, and it could potentially create problems with circulation in that patient's extremity, their hand, where their arm, whatever. They could lose their hand or arm because we didn't recognize that that fistula wasn't working for two days. And now uh, all of a sudden their hand is blue and cold. Well, we weren't doing a very good effect. So if you have a patient that has a fistula 
that should be functioning and they're going to dialysis using it. And, and even if they're not even on a dialysis day, it's, it's Wednesday, and they get dialysis Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you should be checking that sister. That's part of your assessment if you're the nurse, at least, at least once your shift. Again, if there's people living in the sister living, they probably check it once a day. Everything is not utopia, everything is not perfect, but in the real world, we should be assessing that every four hours um, in, in our utopia world, making sure that the circulation is good. How do I know it's good? Well, what's their calculator refill? Um, is their hand cold? Do they have numbness or tingling in their hand? Do I feel a radial pulse on that arm where that fistula is? And then, of course, do I feel the thrill, hear the bruise? Um, over top of where that AV graph is. And this is just a picture that we showed you the other day about infection. And this might be one, one of these spots is arterial and one's venous. I can't tell from the outside, but the dialysis nurse would know. Um, and then this is just a skin rash that's around that fistula and that patient farm. This is a picture of an AV fistula underneath the patient's skin. Many times they're kind of protruding, um, but we can still feel the thrill here and hear the bruise. And this is just showing you a picture of another graph that's underneath somebody's skin. This is showing you different sites that we can use. And again, when they become clogged, we have to notify the doctor. And sometimes they can inject a thrombolytic medication like streptokinase and kind of break up that clod. And, and again, this would be something a physician would decide. Or they might have to take it out and start over again and put another fistula in. So it, Making sure our fistula stays functional is very important because this is basically your kidney lifeline for this patient. Um, so here's our knowledge. If a patient's getting dialysis way declining before and after, use the same scale before and after, same time of the day if you can. If you know your patient's going for dialysis at 7.30, get them up at 6 o'clock. It's their weight. You know what their weight is. Um, monitor the blood pressure continually. What's happening during dialysis? The machine and the solution that they're using is pulling out fluid basically by the, by the concentration gradient, the osmosis that we were talking about. Excuse me. So if it's more hypertonic, that means it has higher sodium concentrate in the solution. It's going to make, where's the water going to go? It's going to go wherever sodium is. It likes to follow sodium. So when the solution is hypertonic, it's going to pull off more fluid and pull out more fluid out of the patient's vascular space inside their body. That's how it works. And then it gets rid of volume for the patient. So the patient before dialysis might weigh 75 kilograms. Now we do dialysis for the last four hours, and now we get their weight, and it might be 73 kilograms. So what we've done is all of the work that a kidney scores on by removing these weights and then patient goes back two days later and the same thing happens again. In between dialysis, what do you think the patient's weight's going to be? It's probably going to go up because they're holding on to fluid and now they need dialysis again and it's not due until Wednesday morning. So by Tuesday night or Wednesday morning right before dialysis, their weight's usually up a little bit. And then they go to dialysis and then the weight comes back down and they start the whole cycle again pretty much every 48 hours. So patients go Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Think about what your patient's gonna be like over the weekend. We were on Saturday and Sunday, two different days where they don't have dialysis or wait for Monday morning to come. What do you think the patient's gonna look like Sunday night late or Monday morning? They're gonna have fluid volume overload by then. Um, again, people are okay. They can make it till Monday morning, but just think about this. If you're working on the weekend and Sunday comes or Sunday night comes and your patient has more crackles, more swellings, or more short of breath, you get their weight, the weight is up by four kilograms, you might have to call the doctor and you do a stat dialysis and just help them to think about things that might happen. A patient on Sunday night, if they're not going till Monday morning, I've had many patients on, on Sundays where I've called the doctor and they said, give them some extra Lasix right now. So we give them Lasix, it's a diuretic, helps get rid of the fluid, and then they go to dialysis Monday morning. So it's just something to think about if you got, you're going to be working weekend, you got a dialysis patient. Keep an eye on them on Sundays because they have went since Friday, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. They're waiting for Monday morning to come and they're developing extra fluid in their body. So Many times on Sundays, we would be calling the doctor and we'll say, give them 40 milligrams away, or 80 milligrams away. So make sure the patient stays stable, keep an eye on their oxygen level, and we're going first thing tomorrow morning to dialysis. So just something to think about when you're working weekends. 
So uh, what are we doing? We're providing care to the access site, making sure that that scanner, that access site is clean and dry. There's no infection there. Um, we're going to uh, obviously do our assessment of the AV fistula, no blood pressures or blood draws on that side. We're never going to do that. Post a sign above the bed that warns that no blood pressures or blood work can be done that site because not everybody knows when you're walking around. Maintain fluid restrictions. And then again, we talked about withholding meds in the morning prior to dialysis. What can happen? Blood sugar can go up after dialysis. Here's the reason why. The dialysis solution itself has sugar in it that makes it uh, part, of the, part of the component of the dialysis solution. It's got a lot of different vitamin and uh, electrolytes, not vitamins, but electrolytes. It's got a lot of different solution particles in it. I'm not a nephrologist, so I don't know exactly what's in it. But what I do know is there's sugar in it. And sometimes when they come back, it makes the patient hyperglycemic. So that might mean for you as a nurse that you may have to adjust their insulin when they get dialysis. It may affect their blood sugar. And when they come back, their blood sugar may be higher. And the patient say, I didn't even eat today. I, I didn't have anything to eat. Well, here's the reason why. Your dialysis solution um, tends to make your blood sugar run a little bit higher. So you might have to adjust your insulin on dialysis days. And then we kind of help us think about for the nurse at the bedside, what things might change based off of the patient getting dialysis. Um, again, the, the color, you know, should be clear by yellow for urine if they're making any, the monitor for signs of infection. This is more talking about the person with peritoneal dialysis, and we're going to go over that in just a minute. Um, so we'll come back to it. Here's our diet. Uh, and education and care for your dialysis patients. Frequent rest periods, they're anemic, they're tired, they have problems with making calcitonin so their bones are weak, they have problems with making erythropoietin so they become anemic, um, they have problems with making renin so their blood pressure um, tends to run low many times. Um, so just think about what is happening with the patient that is not, does not have functional kidney. So they need frequent rest periods, Here's our renal diet. We talked about this the other day. Low protein. Now, once they are on dialysis, once they're active, and forget the fistula, and once they're getting dialysis three times a week, now we can go back to a higher protein diet because we have a way of getting rid of that excess protein that the body is, isn't able to process. When they're going into renal failure or they're not on dialysis yet and they haven't reached that stage of kidney disease, and we'll talk about different stages of kidney disease probably tomorrow, um, they're going to be low protein diet. High carb because they don't have a lot of energy. Low potassium because the potassium usually runs high, so we're not going to want to have them have a lot of potassium products in their diet. We might have to give them calcium supplements because remember, our kidneys aren't working. We're not making calcitonin. We're not using calcium and vitamin D the right way. So we have to put it all together. What kind of diet will we have this patient on? So low protein, give them lots of carbs because they need energy. Low potassium, they might need extra calcium in their diet. And that's okay because they don't make calcium the right way. Low sodium for sure, because low sodium, if we have a high sodium diet, what are they gonna do? Retain more fluid, and that's not what we want for the dialysis patient. So, a uh, low phosphate, why? What does your kidneys do? They, they help you get rid of the electrolytes, they maintain your balance. We have problems with dialysis patients, your phosphorus level tends to run very high because their kidneys aren't working and they're not getting rid of phosphates that we normally get in our diet. So we're going to talk about it. There's a medication called Foslo. We give it to dialysis patients two to three times a day. Every time they eat, it's almost like the pancreatic patient. Why do we give it to them? Because it's, it's Foslo. Well, the way I always remembered it is it makes their phosphorus, phosphorus lower. So what we don't want them to have is foods that are high in phosphorus. We've got to give them this medication when they eat so that it helps get rid of the extra phosphorus in their diet. So when we think about kidneys, what do they do? And then what's going to run high? Our electrolytes are going to be high. Our sodium, our potassium, our phosphorus, they're going to run high. We need to do things to help the patient get rid of all that um, electrolytes in the body system. We're going to monitor and treat their hypertension. That could be the first reason why they have dialysis to begin with or why their kidneys aren't working. 
We're going to keep them on strict intake and output. How much are they taking in? How much are they putting out? Your renal patient is never going to be on unrestricted fluid and drink fluid all day long. It's fine. We'll run the dialysis tomorrow. That's not how it works. We still want to regulate how much they're taking in. So we're using not, we usually don't pick, hook them up to an IV solution most of the time because we don't want to give them excess volume. Um, we don't want them drinking water and having a water pitcher at the bedside. They're usually fluid restricted because their kidneys aren't working and they can't get rid of excess fluid like you and I can when we have working kidneys. Monitor their electrolytes. Potassium level is critical for these people and it usually runs high because they can't get rid of electrolytes. What's going to happen if I have a dialysis patient and I'm constantly giving them Lasix? Well, I might see them with a low potassium because the Lasix is doing that. Most of the time, the, the renal patients are potassium level is high. It's usually at a critical level by the time they, they, they recognize signs and symptoms of it. So keep an eye on the potassium level. Remember, 3.5 to 5, you don't want them to look too high. Don't give them an acid with magnesium. Because again, what your kidney is not doing, they're not filtering, they're not getting rid of electrolytes. So don't pick milk or mag or something that has magnesium in it. Um, don't pick, um, I think it's, you know, is it my or uh, you're going to pick like aluminum hydroxide. So pick, pick an acids that have aluminum base and not magnesium base, is what I'm trying to say. Because we patients can't get rid of the magnesium, and the magnesium level becomes critically high. No NSAIDs because your kidneys aren't working, so they're at risk for bleeding, and we don't want to decrease renal flow. Remember what we said, NSAIDs decrease blood flow to our kidneys. Don't, don't give them NSAIDs. Don't give them Pepto-Bismol because it has aspirin. And we're going to, it could potentially affect the bleeding as well. So these are some key points about if I have a dialysis patient on NSAID or real life, things that we're going to do for them to try to help supplement their kidneys and keep them working um, better. So here's some of our labs. Here's some things that we would anticipate why we're doing it. So it just lifts it over here, some of our interventions, and this is why. Again, don't write this stuff down on a card and just write it down and say, okay, I hope I see that on the test. Understand why we do what we're doing. So here's your meds that you're going to hold. Don't give them diuretics. We're already going to be removing fluid. Now, I just was talking about giving them diuretics, say, on a Sunday night if they're short of breath. Remember, this is your ABC principle. If the patient's having trouble breathing, it's fluid in their lungs. Give them a diuretic. But this is talking about the morning of dialysis. Don't give them diuretics or their blood pressure meds. Why? Because we're going to be removing a lot of excess fluid and the blood pressure is going to drop. We're already losing fluid because we're sending them dialysis. Let's not make it worse by giving them all of our meds and then sending them in. Remember, if I give them their meds at 7 and they don't get dialysis till 8.30, have they absorbed some of them? Yes, they have. How long does it take for absorption in our stomach? Probably about 30 minutes before it really starts getting officially absorbed. And, and about an hour later, we're using that med that we, we just took an hour ago. So don't give them blood pressure meds in the morning hold before they go to dialysis. Here's our rationale. The blood pressure is already going to decrease because we're doing the work for their kidney. They're already losing fluid. We don't need to give them the Lasix in the morning of post dialysis. We don't need to give them the blood pressure meds. We should give it to them when they come back. We may not even have to give it to them when they come back, depending on how tested their dialysis was. We're going to monitor their labs. Why the openers? Because we already said the many times run anemic. We're going to monitor their electrolytes and what their pH is. is, is are they acidotic or alkalotic? Are they in between that 735 and 745? We're going to monitor their um, coag numbers, P2, 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 platelets. Why do we want to know what their platelets are doing? Well, they're getting dialysis. Their kidneys are probably are not functioning. Many times the liver, hand in hand, isn't working quite as well. So they have a higher risk for bleeding. Excess for fluid volume overload and fluid decrease. Now, why do both things happen? Usually what happens with our dialysis patient, most of the time before dialysis, they have fluid volume overload. So that could be the days leading up to when their dialysis is needed. That was their Sunday night, for example. How long will you, the patient will has you fluid volume overload. So we're going to listen to their lungs. What are we going to hear if they have fluid volume overload? Crackles in their lungs, or music from wheezing. They might be short of breath. They might be orthopnic, meaning they need to sit up because of the excess fluid in their lungs. 
they might have distended neck veins because of the excess fluid that they have. After dialysis, what, what do you think will happen? Well, now we've removed lots of fluid from them. Now they might have problems with their blood pressure running too low. So it's, again, this is what we do with dialysis with the fine balance of how much is enough, but we don't want to pull out too much fluid and now the patient comes back. So what I'm saying is before they go, usually fluid volume overload. And then they go to dialysis. Now you're watching them for fluid volume deficit yeah, because you know they had dialysis for 20 for five hours. Now you're taking care of them on three to 11 shifts. They just got back at 1.30 in the afternoon. I'm still going to listen to the lungs. I'm not going to really anticipate they're going to have practice, but what I'm going to pay attention to is the blood pressure today and they're tired and they're weak because dialysis removed a lot of waste products and a lot of fluid from them. So they breathe better, they look a little better, but the patient feels really tired and weak and their blood pressure is running a little well. So just remember, what's what are we doing when we send them to dialysis and what are they going to look like afterwards? What would we expect? Again, intake and output is always going to be picked for these renal patients, always pick that because how do you know how much, how what's working? How much are they drinking? How much do they take in? And this is a patient that comes back and, and dialysis patients, I think it's mind over matter. But again, I think many times dialysis patients are always saying, can I have something else to drink? Why can't I have a water pitcher? How come I only get a little bit of fluid on my breath of spray? You know, because they know they can't have it. It's like anything else. When you know you can't have it, it makes it worse. And that's when you want something to drink. They are dry and thirsty sometimes. Um, and we have to explain to them your kidneys aren't working. So we can't just give you unlimited amounts of fluid. We have to regulate. And normally the doctor will say 1,500 mLs of fluid, or 2,000 or whatever it is. And you work within those parameters for that 24 hours. So suppose somebody was put on a 1,500 liter fluid restriction and I'm the nurse taking care of them. Many times for night shift, we would, we would give them a small amount. We'd say, okay, only 250 can be drank on night shift. That gives us 1,250 left for days and evenings, and that's when people eat their lunch and dinner. So again, it might be split up by your shift. How much volume can this person take in? Are they allowed to take in? Well, if I know my day shift is only 500 mLs, don't take in a huge cup of water with your meds and say, okay, that's all you get. Remember, they're going to want to eat breakfast or lunch, so we have to think about how are we splitting up that fluid restriction for my shift. I know they're going to have breakfast and lunch on my day shift, so I might give them more of that 1500 ml. The doctor, you know, the nurses, uh, again, you guys taking care of the patient might say, 750 is what we're going to use for day shift. And that leads us 750 more all for evening and night shift. And so again, just work it out through the nursing department and with the patient involved. How much of this fluid are you going to want to get during the day? And then how much is going to be left for evening shift so that's when you're going to have your dinner? And at night shift, maybe we only have 250 left. That's only one cup of water throughout the entire night, and that's what taking meds and everything. Do you include the water that the patient's taking with the pills as, you, as part of your fluid restriction? Yes, yes, you do. It's still in, intake that's going in. So you have to remember these patients, give them their meds, but again, don't give them all that extra water because you're using part of the fluid restriction when you're giving them the medication. Sure, you got to give them enough to take your pills with, but you have to get creative with these patients because they can't just drink fluid all day long. The kidneys don't work. And they can't get rid of the volume. So again, urine output is an inaccurate evaluation of renal function. Why? These people on dialysis don't make urine the right way. So for us to say, hey, the, the output was only 200 mLs, we need to give them more fluid. That's not true with these patients. They don't make urine to begin with. So don't, yes, regulate their, look at their urine output. But remember, most people with normal functioning kidneys the minimal amount we want is 30 ml an hour. Typically, what do we make? About 50 to 60 ml an hour. That's the kidneys that work. These people don't have kidneys that work. So looking at their urine output is not going to give us a good indication. It's going to be other things that we're looking at, like their urine excitement or their weight before they go when they come back. So again, there's something called dry weight. This is the weight that the patient's going to be right before dialysis, the best that they're going to be before uh, 
right, I mean, right after dialysis, the best that they're going to be in the most efficient weight where the patient feels the best, the blood pressure is good, um, their intake and output is regulated, they just had dialysis, and now we've got a good picture of this patient. And basically, that's our goal. It's called the dry weight. It's the best weight for that patient where they feel the best, and that's what we're shooting for when we're doing dialysis. Uh, again, when we send the patient to dialysis, look how much, remember how we talked about doors and pieces, we can only remove up to one meter. Pairs and pieces only up to four liters. Same thing with the dialysis patient. We can't just remove eight liters of fluid from the patient because our body only has eight liters of fluid to begin with. So what, do, what can we do? We can only remove two to two and a half liters in that three to four hour dialysis period. So again, there's a limit to how much we can pull out because the patient's body is not going to um, balance itself if we take out too much. There's a patient coming back from dialysis. Now we're going to monitor them for a low blood pressure. Here's one thing that I've seen in API. If your turn, if your fistula, they went to dialysis this morning, they came back to you. The fistula itself has an arterial um, uh, port in there. It has a venous port. After they get dialysis, they put a little bit of heparin in that fistula to help keep it from clotting off. But sometimes things happen. Sometimes that arterial part that's underneath that skin or that fistula starts bleeding. How would we know? Well, there's, there's blood, obviously, that would be pooling underneath the skin. The arterial, um, the arterial part of that graft might be leaking into the patient's tissue in their arm. What would we do if we suspect that that patient is bleeding under their skin or at their AV fistula site, where they, particularly in the arterial part of it? What happens after dialysis? They, they are able to um, kind of give the heparin and then allow that fistula to seal itself back off, and it's not really open to the outside skin anymore. But there's a risk of bleeding can happen, that that clot can form like it should to seal it off, just like if you cut yourself. So I've had patients come back from dialysis and their fistula is bleeding. How would I know that? Well, I'm going to start seeing that their hand is going to turn dusty. The arm is going to start swelling underneath where the fistula is. The color of their arm is not going to look so good. What would I do if I notice the bleeding is happening? I think it is. I should have a tourniquet at the bedside. So this is basically something that you remember, kind of like an exception of the bedside for somebody that has a trait. Keep a tourniquet at the bedside. At the very least, um, what you're going to do is throw the blood pressure cuff on, pump that up, right? That's an emergency situation. If somebody has a subclavian line, remember I said they might have a subclavian or ephemeral, they have a blue cap and a red cap. The blue cap, the red cap is the arterial portion of the, of the breast. So if the patient, let's say they have a really low platelet count or their INR is high and they have a risk of bleeding, all of a sudden you start noticing that there's blood backing up in that central line or blood coming out of that arterial part of that central line, what should you do? Clamp. Clamp off the arterial line. It would just be like if somebody was bleeding, same exact principle. Remember, that fistula and that graft is direct access to an artery and a vein. So if bleeding is happening, you clamp, clamp the arterial side first because that's the most flow and the most blood going to come out of the arterial portion of that central line or that graft itself. So it's just a complication, doesn't happen a lot, but what we need to recognize is this graft or this central line is a direct access to the artery and vein of the patient. And if you notice bleeding, it's in the arm where the fistula is, put a tourniquet above where that graft is. That way you cut off the blood supply and you're going to call the doctor or 911. It's an emergency situation. You're going to have to stop them from bleeding. If you don't have a tourniquet nearby, throw a blood pressure cuff in your arm and pump it up and leave it pumped up because you're bleeding from the graft. Again, call 911, call a doctor. There's going to need to get go to surgery and stop this bleeding. So it's just something to think about that could potentially happen because remember, a fistula or a dialysis access is a direct access to an artery in a vein. It's like for infection, and I've seen a question come up about that in API. Always oh, assess for infection around the site if it's warm, if there's swelling, if it's tender. Remember, um, 
when you're cleaning that sun or, or get, when you're getting ready to do dialysis, you will always see, and now in particular with COVID happening, you will always see the dialysis nurse using strict surgical asepsis, right? Uh, accessing that fistula with a mask on, with goggles, certainly with uh, face shield on, anything that will eliminate that source getting infection because again it's a direct access to the patient circulation you don't want them to develop an infection because we coughed on it or something else because you're the nurse nearby so strict surgical asepsis when you're accessing that fistula when you're accessing the central line port and that's what the dialysis must be doing monitor the vital signs monitor the patient's temperature infection anything that might indicate they have an infection going on we talked about Feeling for a thrill, listening for a brewery. Make sure the patient has good circulation in their hand and they're not telling you that their left hand is numb when they have a fistula in their arm. You should think that that's a problem, and it is. Again, avoid any trauma to where the shunt is. Um, try to have the patient not lift the back side of their body, limit their activity, no blood pressures, no blood draws on that side. Expect the client to not carry things on that side. Try not to sleep on that arm if you can help it. Anything that you're doing that will help keep that fistula working for the longest period of time. This is talking about feeling for a, uh, a thrill and listening for a brewery. And this is talking about um, how you do that. Um, again, looking at the color of the blood. Arterial blood that comes out is going to be bright red. Venous blood is going to be darker in color. And arterial blood is carrying the oxygen. And if you were dialysis nursing with through that blood, you, you would see, you would obviously see that it's a brighter red color. That's, that's blood that we're getting from an artery. Here's our renal diet. We talked about that. Prior to dialysis, low protein, high carb, low potassium. Um, calcium supplements might be needed. Low phosphorus. This is our renal patient. Once they're on dialysis and they've reached that stage five kidney disease and dialysis is doing all the work for them, now they can go back to higher protein because we've got a way of getting rid of that excess protein. And what do I mean by higher protein? So now they can eat more meat and fish, nuts, beans, the things that have more protein in them. Most sources of protein are listed here, meat, poultry, fish, eggs, and dairy. Um, can the person on dialysis eat some of these things? Yes, but they shouldn't have a high protein, uh -uh. Can the person that has renal disease eat these things? Yes, we don't completely eliminate protein from their diet, but what we don't want them doing is eating a lot of protein if their kidneys aren't working, because it's only going to build up. Remember, creatinine is a measure of muscle and protein breakdown. If our kidneys aren't working, our creatinine is going to go up. So once they start dialysis, now they can go back to eating more of this in their diet, and that's okay. And we actually would want them to eat high quality proteins to keep their body healthy. Because we've got a way now with dialysis to help get rid of that. So it's just something to think about. What do we do early on when they're in renal disease? And then once they start dialysis and we have a way of doing that, we can go back to allowing them to eat more proteins, and that's kind of what we want them to do. So again, why is low protein necessary? This talks about it when the body digested, it makes urea as a, as a waste product, the kidneys not working, urea can build up. So eating low protein will reduce the workload of the kidneys. And then once the kidneys are on dialysis, now we can have high quality protein. That's what we're gonna pick for this patient. You may need to limit diet dairy products. So this is just another key point about our dialysis patient. Can they drink dairy products when they have milk store? They can have some, but in moderation. Why the high phosphorus? Remember, our kidneys aren't working. We can't get rid of electrolytes. High phosphorus is not going to be what we want to have the patient eating every day. So again, limit uh, limit protein. Do we have proteins in dairy products? Yes, we have cheese and uh, you know the dairy portion of it. The fats, proteins are in these products. But look what high quality protein is. Animal products. So that's the best kind of protein for these patients. Vegetable products are considered low quality protein. So again, they only need some types of protein each day. There's some dietary guidelines for uh, um, adults. Uh, and it's talking about starting on hemodialysis. Now they can eat more high protein foods. Go back to the previous slide. What is high quality protein? Here they are, animal products. Fish, poultry, eggs, and meat. Um, remember, keep an eye on the phosphorus, so dairy products are phosphorus, so uh, I know somebody said the other day, I don't like nutrition, 
it's hard to remember what has what in it, what's good for this patient. Um, but here's a slide that will tell you things that are good for this dialysis patient. Um, no salt, not a lot of salt. Don't eat high potassium foods. Don't eat high phosphorus foods because we, our body can't get rid of them. Um, learn how much you can safely drink. Salt and sodium work together, so we want less salty foods. Um, use herbs, spices, low salt flavor to enhance the food because the patients will say without any salt in it, it's terrible. But again, don't use a lot of table salt, use other things to spice up the food. Um, avoid salt substitutes that have potassium in them. Why? Because the potassium level is going to go extremely high. So you've got to be careful on what you substitute with. People on dialysis, now they've started dialysis, need more protein. They need more high quality protein. So what we recommend is about eight to, ten, eight to 10 ounces of high protein foods every day. And what's our high protein foods? Here they are, meat, fish, poultry. If they don't like meat, eggs. So it gets tricky if your patient is a lacto, a patient is a strict vegetarian, what are they not getting? They're not getting a lot of high quality protein. So you just have to basically find ways to balance out their diet. And again, that's not the best solution for the dialysis patient. We want them to eat these high quality protein products so when they are eating protein, they're getting a lot of uh, protein from it because it has a lot of protein in it. Low protein products are going to be your vegetables, your beans, your nuts and stuff. They're still protein, but not as much as the meat and the fish and stuff. Yeah. Um, but here it is. I mean, even though peanut butter, nut seeds, dry beans, seeds, lentils have protein, they are not high quality protein. They don't... Um, they don't have a lot of protein in them. And the other thing that they have in them is potassium and phosphorus, which is not good. So again, a renal patient, a dialysis patient, has a lot of teaching that they have to do. And usually they have a dietitian, or many times they do, or somebody at the dialysis center that talks to them about what are you eating in your diet and what are good things to eat and not good things to eat because of the fact that you're going to get rid of that. Uh, patients with compromised kidney function must adhere to a renal diet. So make yourself a note card. Here it is. What is a renal diet? This is your kidney patient. Low sodium, low phosphorus, low protein. Once they start on dialysis, we can go back up to that high quality protein. Um, limiting fluids is on a renal diet. And some patients, and typically most patients, have to limit to calcium. They may even have to limit, limit calcium, again, because their kidneys aren't working. So this is all adjusted patient by patient basis. But on a general note, here's your renal diet. Every bo person's body is different. And again, here it is. It's crucial that a renal dietitian work with each patient to come up with a diet that is good for this patient. So overall, what do we know about a renal diet? Here it is. Low sodium, low phosphorus, low protein, high quality protein once dialysis starts, um, low potassium, low phosphorus, uh, things that we know our body can't get rid of, low sodium for sure, because we're going to hold okay. on to more water and certainly no, limit the the So here's our last uh, stuff about yeah, Okay, so let's go over what our dry weight means. What is dry weight? Dry weight is your weight without the excess fluid that builds up in between dialysis treatment. So again, this weight is similar to what a person with normal kidney function would weigh. So what, what does that even mean? It's usually the weight that the patient is at right after dialysis. Say they had dialysis this morning from 7 to 11. We're going to get their weight right at the end of dialysis. We've pulled off so much enough fluid that the patient um, fluid volume status is good, their blood pressure is good, they no longer have crackles, they no longer have edema, they're as good as they're going to get. That, that's our dry weight. So basically, it's the weight that we can get the patient to. We figured out that we pulled off two liters of fluid, and the blood pressure is still fine, 110 over 80. What if we, uh, with dialysis, remove too much fluid, and now the blood pressure is 80 over 40? That's not where we want the patient to be. That's too much. So dry weight is kind of like our goal. What are we trying to get to in between dialysis treatments that the patient feels the best, all their vital signs are the best, their their intake is, is good, their output, what we remove from dialysis is 2.25 liters, 
when the patient is at their best status. That's kind of like us, we're urinating, we're, it's working, our kidneys are fine, we feel okay, our blood pressure is okay. That's kind of what our normal kidneys do for us. So basically our dry weight is what we consider like our goal weight for this patient. We have done dialysis, we've removed the excess fluid. The patient's still stable, we didn't take off too much, but we took off enough that they don't have any symptoms of low blood pressure, their weight back to a good baseline for that patient. And now we're gonna send that patient back to the facility or back home. That's their dry weight. It's kind of like our goal weight at the dialysis where the patient feels the best and we've done the best um, filtering for them. That's considered the dry weight. So it's, it's like a goal that we want the patient to be at. So again, patients on dialysis for three to four hours, we're not gonna pull off more than 2.5 liters. Remember, every liter that is removed from the patient is two pounds, is about two pounds. So what we're looking at is if we remove two liters from the patient, how much are we taking off? Four pounds of fluid. How are we gonna see that? Well, we're gonna recognize that before they get on the dialysis scale, the weight was 158, and now on I mean, the dialysis machine, now they're 158, now, after we remove two liters of fluid, they're probably going to be about 154 pounds. And again, remember, we can't just take 10 pounds of weight off of somebody and think they're going to feel okay in a matter of four hours. So it has to be regulated. So here's our dry weight. It's our goal weight. At the end of our dialysis cycle, or time frame, Monday at 11 o'clock, we're done. No signs and symptoms of low blood pressure. The patient feels good. That's what we're trying to get back to. So you'll see doctors write in order. Uh, dry weight, the patient dry weight could be 152 pounds. So what the dialysis people know or nurse knows is we're trying to get to that 152 pound mark. And, and again, we're regulating how much fluid we're removing to, to get us to that point. So it's a goal weight after dialysis. It feels good. If we took off too much weight, too much volume, how would the patient feel? Low blood pressure, tired, pass out. People pass out on dialysis. So again, we can remove too much or we can remove too little. So there's a regulation, there's a balance. Um, but this equilibrium, all that really is talking about is basically it, it's triggered most of the time when somebody first is put on dialysis because we remove too much volume too quickly. So it just talks about what it is, rapid removal of solutes like sodium, potassium, phosphorus, calcium uh, from the body during dialysis. What happens when the patient, when this happens? What do we do? What are we gonna pick? Well, if we know the patient isn't tolerating dialysis, and many times we can figure this out, the patient just started on dialysis last week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. This is your first week of dialysis ever in your life. This equilibrium syndrome means that we remove the fluid or the solute too quickly in their body just to adjust it. So how does the patient feel when that happens? They get nauseous, they get a headache, they start vomiting, they might have a seizure or coma, and this is just a complication of dialysis. So what do you think we would do if this happens? Go back to this. This syndrome often occurs for clients who are new to dialysis. What are we going to do to prevent this from happening? Dialyze for a shorter period of time? or slow the dialysis machine down. They obviously did not tolerate getting on a dialysis machine first time. So many times we'll start off slowly, a little less time frame, and build up to that maximum amount of time that the, that the patient's body can be on dialysis. So this is just one complication that can happen. It usually happens when somebody is just getting started or new to dialysis, and what's happened, we remove too much too quick. So what would we pick? As our answer, dialyze for a shorter period of time or slow down the dialysis itself and change the fluid that we're using. Um, again, the incidence of this has fallen in recent years because people are figuring out better and better how to start somebody on dialysis and how to get them used to being on dialysis. It's like, you know, obviously we're doing all the work for your kidneys, your body has to get used to it. Here's the signs and symptoms. Um, and here's why it might happen. And we don't always really understand, but what we do, what we do know, it usually happens in the first few sessions. It usually happens with elderly or younger because they're not used to fluid being removed from your body that quickly. Um, and then what do we do? We slow it down, slow down the dialysis, slow down the time frame, 
Um, again, stop the dialysis if you need to. We're not just going to keep on letting removing fluid in the patient has seizure. These are the things that we have to recognize. So all I want you to know about this is um, who's higher risk for it. When does it normally happen? Usually when we first start dialysis, what do we do about it? Go back to the slide, slow down the dialysis uh, machine, dialyze for one hour instead of four hours until the patient's body gets rid of it. And then here's our signs and symptoms. So this is your patient that, okay, this is their first week in dialysis. When we start dialysis and two hours in, they're saying, I have a headache, I feel confused, they're, um, they're not awake as much as they were, they're throwing up. We got to recognize that this is probably what's going on with this patient. Okay, simple. I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. Um, uh, Steele syndrome, and then we'll take a break. What is this? This is another complication of a patient that has a fistula in it. This basically, all this means is the patient has lost circulation to that hand where that fistula is. And look what happens. They have pain in their hand. Their hand might become numb, pale, or cold. Um, they might get lots of function, function in that hand. Um, it's caused by ischemia resulting from the graft that was installed and, and basically has clotted off. So two complications that can happen. This equilibrium syndrome, usually with a new dialysis patient, usually when there's too much volume too quick, we got to slow down dialysis, slow down the rate, slow down the time. Who's at risk for this equilibrium, this equilibrium sy syndrome? Somebody that recently started dialysis, an older patient, a pediatric patient, the kids have to get dialysis too if the kidney's not working. Um, so what's the signs and symptoms? Nausea, vomiting, headache, confusing, seizures, going into a coma. That's the this equilibrium syndrome. Steele syndrome is cut off of circulation at the AV fistula site where the graft, the graft is. So what do you think gonna, the patient's gonna look like? The patient's hand's gonna be cold, pale, um, numb, no circulation there. What can potentially happen? The patient could lose that, that entire hand or, or arm, depending on where the fistula is. If it's in the upper arm, we might have to, we might end up with a, an amputation in that arm. So it's a complication, yes, it's a bad complication. So how do we try to prevent this from happening? Good assessment of that fistula site, good assessment of the patient's hand on the arm where the fistula is. Compare that hand to the other hand. Um, if you, all of a sudden the patient says, my hand is pale and I can't feel any, my hand is numb and I can't feel anything, that's a problem. So you potentially could have loss of function in gangrene. That's just called Steele's syndrome. Even if, so we have to have good assessment skills. It can be fixed if we identify it early. Something's not right, but some kind of graft or some kind of clot in that graft itself, okay? So there's a couple of our complications. So before we talk about peritoneal dialysis, let's take a break for about 10 minutes, um, 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll come back on here and finish the rest of this PowerPoint. Okay, everybody still with me?